Mr. Osborne is a professional horticulturalist with 45 years of experience in the green industry. In the mid-1990s, his extensive horticultural background was broadened to include turf grass management. Chip has been transitioning sports and recreational turf for 15 years. He is a NOFA accredited organic land care professional and a member of the board of directors of Beyond Pesticides in Washington, D.C. He's a 15-year elected member of the Town of Marblehead Recreation and Park Commission. In 2007, he founded Org Osborne Organics, a company that provides natural turf consulting services and education on a national level to business, municipal, and institutional clients and the federal government. We are extremely lucky to have Chip join us today. Please welcome him back to Wellesley. Well, thank you. Um, you know, you should be very proud here in Wellesley as a national leader uh, and uh, being among the, the first municipalities uh, back in 2009 to take this step to uh, organic management of public lands. Uh, it uh, is known nationally that you did that then and that this past year or this you know past several months it was now strengthened into a formal organic IPM program uh, that encompasses all town land so that's something that uh, the Natural Resources Commission should be very proud they you know sort of drove that bus in the beginning and all of you should be proud that you're part of that as a community of having that recognition uh, what's happening now is this idea of organic management uh, is not just a few small towns here or there. It truly is happening on a national level. Uh, it is being noticed by the EPA. It is being noticed by major corporate interests in the United States. It's, it's, uh, I've just been working for the last six months in Southern California with the charged with the project of transitioning 35 outdoor shopping centers to all organic management. 100 foot palm trees, all the tropicals, 1,500 olive trees, very elaborate landscapes that are created. All, one company owns all of this. They're not doing it for any other greater good for the world other than it makes corporate sense because they understand that if they can build the life in the soil and get a naturally sustaining soil system, that they can reduce inputs over time. And what they've been currently doing is just pumping synthetic water-soluble nitrogen year after year, pumping it in, pumping it in, pumping it in, and the costs go up. At the corporate level, they realize that to become sustainable and allow systems to operate more on their own with reduced input by us over time, that makes corporate sense. So the idea that this is happening on a national level in some very big situations um, really shows that organic land care or organic lawn care and these projects in Southern California are not grass only five percent of this landscape is grass uh, it's a six and a half million square feet of 95 percent ornamental and trees and native Southern California plant material. So that's where the industry is going. That's where we're doing. But what we're going to talk today about is our own little situation, our own lawns, and um, you know what we actually are, are looking at. And I'm going to troubleshoot instead of the typical, in my typical lawn care 101, which I call simple steps to organic lawn care. I've switched it up a little bit. Brandon threw me out a suggestion, and it was great. And so I put something together. Uh, uh, you know, and, and look at actually what's in our lawns and what it is we're trying to do with it. Um, at the end, if there's time, I'm certainly happy to answer questions, but the major thrust of questions, we've got uh, landscape professionals, professional fertilizer uh, distributors outside, uh, Dr. Sarah Little is out there, so people that are there to answer your questions that may be generated um, in this, you can see here, this is not the typical lawn. It is a lawn where in the front here, we have something called Poa Supina, which uh, University of Massachusetts Cooperative Extension brands that as a weed. Uh, it is a grass. It's a cool season grass that loves wet shade. And that's what that green is in there, Poa Supina. You can see the 
the bulbs coming up through it and you know down below there is grass that is unmanaged it's fescue grass uh, but the grounds all around the state and the estate are that monoculture of Kentucky bluegrass so it's an idea that on this property that we're managing there's a very diverse things happening there it's not just all that expanse of um, expanse of grass um, so why go organic? The obvious reasons, and I'm sure that here in, uh, you know, in Wellesley, you're more familiar with this than some towns I go in, and this is, I have to spend, you know, 20 minutes talking about this. You know, there are reasons, and the reasons are human health and the environment. Very quickly, it's just important to understand that, you know, even if, with Wellesley, we're not using pesticides on public spaces. Um, but um, you know they can certainly be used in private spaces because Massachusetts statute that uh, governs anything a municipality wants to do. Um, you know the, the products that we're buying out there from a chemical nature to manage our lawn are largely untested no matter what anybody tells you. Um, the EPA tests nothing. They've actually just found out that some of the exposures that we have to different chemicals and exposures that we're getting through genetically modified food are now beginning to exceed acceptable levels. So do you know what the government has done? They've raised the threshold. They haven't gone back and said this product is now a problem. They've gone and just lifted the threshold. So when they get basically with all of these lawn care products, these chemicals that we have been taught to use for a number of years, all that's ever tested by the manufacturer is the pure active ingredient, which usually is two, three, four, five percent of the bag, box, or bottle. The rest of it is untested. The rest of it is inert ingredients protected by trade secret laws. We don't even know what those chemicals are. Many times they're more toxic than the pesticide itself. So then that testing is exposing laboratory animals, and then they watch what happens to that animal, and then they watch future generations, and then that value is called LD50, the lethal dose, what it takes to kill the animal. And then that is extrapolated to the uh, population of a 150 pound male, not an infant, woman, child, or toddler. Very different than the 150 pound male, we all know that. So that LD50 is based on the model of risk assessment. If the risk of that product outweighs the benefit, it comes to market. Uh, it does not come to market. If the benefit outweighs the risk, it can come to market. But make no mistake, that benefit can be corporate interest. The benefit is not generally protective of us. So that's what we're up against, that idea. So my take on the whole thing is, I simply don't need your synthetics anymore because you'll see me close here with picture after picture after picture where there's been no chemical intervention and the landscape would meet pretty much everybody's expectations. So the idea that organic or natural works uh, really is the message that we go forward with. There's no question that there's too much grass in the world. We heard Doug talk about how much grass there actually is. And, you know, the, it, the, the go between golf courses covering an area the size of the state of Connecticut and growing, he used New England as the reference for grass. I've always used the state of Nebraska as the, as the size of grass out there. But we're very guilty about putting it where it doesn't belong. There's always the mantra of the right plant in the right place. One of my frustrations is with landscape architecture and design, and very often if there's a question on what kind of plant, put, put grass there. I can show you municipal after municipal after municipal situation where grass has been put in a place that it should not be. It ends up to be all weeds. They're using herbicides on it. The insects get in. It's always under stress. And there's a huge input of product to try to treat symptoms. And that's what pesticides do. They treat symptoms. They don't solve problems. So at that very beginning, if we didn't put grass there, we wouldn't have that problem. So we do that. We put it where it doesn't belong. Some grass absolutely should go away. I have a client. Uh, I don't do residential lawn care, but I do manage uh, four or five large estate properties. And one woman down in Greenwich, Connecticut has 90,000 square feet of grass on a 10-acre property. She walks it once a year with me. The rest of it is looking at the house. So I've been saying, gotta get rid of grass, get rid of grass. And she, no, I love my grass, don't touch my grass. 
So two years ago, I went and I ripped up 10 or 15,000 square feet of her grass and took it off to the compost pile and I never told her. <laughs> so we started to do our walk and she said, what's different here? I said, well, there's 6,000 square feet of grass there that you gone, that you never, you know, is now gardens. And another group, she loves it. She thinks it's her idea. <laughs> That's my goal. That's what I want. I want her to own that. So in our last walk, I said, what about if we get rid of all of this grass and I put another tree and a bunch more woodland plants? Boom, I'm going to lose another 20,000 square feet. I just did her backyard renovation this past week. We now have an area that is, we're picking out the grass by hand to encourage the moths, and it will be a 2,000 square foot carpet of moths, where historically in the past, she's paid somebody to rake up the moss and put down grass seed. So it's a culture change for her. But now all of a sudden she realizes, and you'll see a couple of pictures of her landscape in here. We need to set reasonable expectations for our lawns. Uh, does it have to be that 100% monoculture? Probably not. The 100% monoculture was forced on us by an industry for corporate profits, not any other reason. Prior to the 1950s, white clover was part of every single grass seed mix because clover is a legume that fixes atmospheric nitrogen and puts it down in the soil. But when these herbicides were developed post-World War II, they needed to sell them. So they branded clover as a weed, and they sold us that product to kill that weed. They just so happened to have bags of chemical nitrogen over here to sell us when we just lost the nitrogen from killing that weed. So that's how we got to where we are. Is that reasonable? Is that the way it should be? Uh, that's the way they wanted it to be, and that's sort of where we are today. Um, that grass that remains, the one thing that is for certain, that grass should always remain for a reasonable lawn area around our residences, public parks, sports for our kids, uh, golf, uh, recreation, passive and active, but that grass that remains has to be managed organically. We live in a chemical cloud and if we can get rid of some chemical exposures, we should, and grass absolutely is a way to do that. When we manage grass or any aspect of the landscape, we now are beginning to look at it as a system. You hear of ecosystems. Well, that lawn in your yard is a system. It's what you see and what you don't see. So to manage or understand that system, it's a basic understanding of soil biology. Basically, at some point in high school, when a biology teacher said, picked up a put up their hand and said a handful of soil contains billions of organisms that nature put there to grow things. That's a fact. Chemical management bypasses that. All of the four-step programs bypass that. They don't acknowledge. They acknowledge that there is soil, uh, you know, soil chemistry and soil texture, sand, silt, and clay, and soil biology, that there are things living down there. <coughs> But in conventional turf grass and landscape management, those things that are living in the soil are not important to management. So therefore, all of those conventional products either compromise the biomass or completely bypass it. So we're not making it, taking advantage of what nature has put into place. Uh, we embrace the exclusive use of natural organic product. If you uh, decide that you want to eliminate pesticides for weed control, insect control, you also have to eliminate synthetic fertilizers and move to organic, or natural organic fertilizers. Because synthetic fertilizers are just 25 or 50 pound bags of salt. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are salt. So you end up fertilizing your lawn with salts that give nutritional value to the grass. Probably only 15 pounds of that beneficial salt in that bag. The other 35 pounds is, is non-beneficial salt. So the idea that you continue to buy that fast-acting uh, water-soluble fertilizer and be successful with reducing pesticides won't happen because those, those four-step fertilizer-type products create a dependency upon pesticide uh, control applications. And that's not by accident. That is by design. You really don't separate those three. And then cultural practices, things like the proper mowing and the proper irrigation. You know, we all hear a good, healthy lawn should be cut at three inches. Three inches is the ideal stress-free height to grow grass. Every cooperative extension and university will tell you that. It's not mimicking a golf course fairway and cutting it an inch and a half. 
you know, the grass is under stress at an inch and a half. So every half inch you cut your lawn below three inches, it will cost you incrementally more money to manage it to your higher sets of expectations. So regulating watering and regulating mowing and doing those cultural things that we know are necessary. So they, I've titled this, you know, help. I don't know what's in my lawn. And most of us don't. We just look at that lawn and that's what it is. But what's really there? So let's take a look at what we can see and then what we can't see. And when we manage now a lawn, we are managing equally to what you can see, which are the blades of grass, and everything that you don't see, which is the root system and all the microbial life that's down there, and the structure of the soil itself. So in our lawns, we have grass. All of the grass that's out there is non-native. There's no native grasses in Wellesley that are managed for cemeteries or parks or lawns or sports fields or golf courses. It all came from Western Europe and the British Isles. They're referred to as the cool season grasses. Their ideal temperature ranges are 55 to 65 soil and 65 to 75 air. So this spring, as, as bad as it's been for us to get out there and enjoy doing things, grass has been really happy. Uh, you could probably see lawns that are typically, you know, right now most people can have the worst lawn in the world, but right now it looks perfect. Because it's in this ideal wheelhouse of where things want to be. Soil temperature right here in Wellesley now is just about 58 or 60 degrees, and we're still shy of the air temperature, but that's the temperature climate that happens in the British Isles don't get cold extremes and you don't get high extremes temperatures between 30 and 75 or 80 they don't gra our grasses don't like zero degree winters and they don't like 90 degree summers because they don't have the genetics to deal with it when you think of the grass in your lawn and you are managing it either without fertilizer or with fertilizer always think that spring equals top growth fall equals root growth our grasses do not have genetics to grow aggressively in two directions at the same time. So if you apply fertilizer now, you're going to stimulate top growth at the expense of the root growth. If you apply fertilizer in the fall, you'll get very little happening up top, but all of that aggressive growth will happen down below. The grasses, here's that, this is, the, this is one picture of, this is the landscape in Greenwich, Connecticut. And it's all out back here beyond where that tractor is. That's where we just turned that back into woodland garden and big beds of moss. We have four different kinds of grasses that you can grow here. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass, which is the, the reputation of the Cadillac of all grasses. Uh, it uh, is that better homes and gardens lawn. It is, if you put down lawn from sod, uh, chances are it's Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass needs the most attention, the most water, what we call the most cultural intensity, the most labor put into it, the most fertilizer put into it, because it has genetics that do that. But it also is the grass that reproduces very rapidly left to right. So it thickens itself by virtue of underground stems called rhizomes. So if you're trying to fill in a bare patch, this is the perfect grass to do that because it aggressively grows sideways and fills. So in most lawns, if you have this at 25 or 30 percent of your lawn, you will get all the benefits with not too many of the high intensity input drawbacks. Perennial ryegrass is the grass you should be using right now to fill thin turf or bare spots because perennial ryegrass will germinate in seven to 10 days with the temperatures we have right now. Kentucky bluegrass right now, if you put a Kentucky bluegrass seed down tomorrow, it's going to be seven weeks before you have something to cut because Kentucky bluegrass takes 21 days to germinate and another four weeks to establish. So perennial ryegrass is the fast fill, <coughs> thicken the lawn, Right now, moving forward, it's, think of spring equals weeds, fall equals grass. When days get longer and temperatures get warmer, 
weeds are going to grow faster than grass. In the fall, most weed seed will not germinate. So from the 18th of August on, you can grow only grass without weed pressures. So fall is the best time to start any new lawn or new construction because the genetics of the grass coincide with the fall months of the year. So right now, it's a foot race to see what's going to grow first, the weed or the grass. So if you have a bare spot, nature abhors a vacuum. Nature will put a weed there pretty quickly if you don't get some grass there. Perennial ryegrass is the grass to do that. Tall fescue is the most widely adapted grass to a different environmental conditions. Sun to shade, drought tolerant, deep strong root system, able to tolerate semi-poor soils able to tolerate some compacted soils uh, because of its deep aggressive root system. So tall fescue is a utility grass. Uh, it is a grass that's strong, it's durable. If you have kids in the backyard, they can't destroy it. Its downside is it doesn't have that really great reproductive structure that the Kentucky bluegrass does. So that's why we mix them together to get a different broad base of genetics. Stay away from monocultures. Fine fescue is the shade grass a member of the fescue family but if you buy a shady grass seed it will be predominantly creeping red fescue or chewings fescue they love the shade they will tolerate not not terribly deep shade but you know moderate shade but it wants to be dry shade it does not like wet shade that grass that I showed you under the birch tree there that poa supina that rough bluegrass that's the wet shaded grass this would be dry shade shade, very little nitrogen, doesn't need any water. You'd water it a little bit to get it established from seed. Once you got it established, you would never water it again. Last summer in the, in the drought that we had, fine fescue never went dormant, never lost its color. So that's its, that, that's its strong point. So now you can see that you use the right grass in the right location. If we took Kentucky bluegrass, and put it in a shady spot instead of fine fescue, within two years that bluegrass would thin itself right out and would no longer be satisfactory. So it's the right plant, the right base of genetics in the right place. So out there in the law we've got soil. So soil can be a functional medium for plant growth. It anchors the plant. Uh, whenever we begin any type of a serious lawn care program, we're always doing a soil test. $25 at the University of Massachusetts, and more often than not, it will save you money. Uh, you go on umass.edu, up in the search engine in the top right side. Uh, you're just going to plug in uh, soil test, and it'll take you right to the testing laboratory webpage. And you would order a test there, basic soil test plus organic matter, and I think it's $25 or $26. Uh, no, it's actually $21. It's $15 for the basic test and $6 for organic matter. That'll tell you what the pH is, whether you need to lime or not. They will give you their recommendations for fertilizer in chemical fertilizer recommendations. Unfortunately, they just can't get themselves to break away to be comfortable in making organic recommendations yet. Um, by, any, by all means, if any of you in the room ever decide to, to do the soil test, uh, reach out to me, tell me you've done it, plug in Wellesley in the search engine, uh, I mean up in the message uh, part of the email, I will read it. Uh, my, my email address is just at my website, osborneorganics.com, and my initial CO. So CO at Osborne Organics, you know, just tell me that you heard me in Wellesley. I'll look at the soil test. You can electronically just send it to me, and I'll tell you what to do. Uh, soil chemistry is the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, the ability of the soil to hold on to nutrients, the acidity or alkalinity of the soil, and the organic matter fraction. The organic matter fraction is the home for the microbes. So the better the organic matter, the better the microbial home is going to be. So if we have low organic matter, it's like a studio apartment. If we have high organic matter, we've got the luxury condominium. So it's really what that organic matter fraction is, and that tells us how successful we can build, be in growing a microbial community. Soil texture, sand, silt, and clay. I venture that your soil here is like most of the rest of this region as a sandy loam, meaning the soil is going to have about 65% sand, maybe somewhere between 4 and 8% clay, and the balance will be silt. 
That is the ideal soil anywhere in the United States to grow grass. So by virtue of where you are in Massachusetts, there are 49 other states that are jealous of the soil that you have here to grow grass. So there's, unless it's a new construction site where a contractor has brought in substandard material at a really low cost, which happens all the time, unfortunately, your native soils are choice. Uh, organic matter should be 5% on average, and that's just about what you have. When I manage in Nevada, I have 1% organic matter. Southern California is 0.8% organic matter. So the resources of the soil are nowhere near what they are here. We now have soil tests that we can test for the biological life in the soil. So I can actually send a sample, and we've done that here in Wellesley on the, on the sports fields, and actually understood what microbes are in that soil. And then when we develop fertility programs, we are not just meeting the needs of the grass with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but we're putting things in there like humic acids to feed the fungal life in the soil. Putting something, if you want to really make your lawn pop for about 25 or 30 cents per thousand square feet, go to the kitchen cabinet, take out a bottle of grandma's molasses, put one ounce of molasses in three or four gallons of water and spray it on the lawn and within 10 days you'd be amazed at what happens. Because molasses is a bacterial food and bacteria as single cell organisms are right at the heart of what's happening nutritionally down there uh, in the biomass. So as simple as that, you don't need, see, I, I did a talk, I was in Utah a couple of months ago, and my talk was beyond NPK, because we're so fixated on nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Look at big, look at agribusiness, what do they do? Jack it up with nitrogen. It's all they do. When you go to those soils out there, if you went to Iowa and took a soil sample in a cornfield, there's nothing there. It's just, the focus is on NPK, and it has been for 100 years. We're fertilizing high-end turf now at one-tenth of a pound of nitrogen, 10 times less than what the conventional industry does. But we're putting in things like molasses, like brewer's yeast. Brewer's yeast does something specific. Micronutrients, the, um, things that typically were not thought of for lawn fertilization programs. But by putting things in that address the soil and then putting in things that meet the needs of the grass, now we're coming out complete. Uh, if you get a chance, stop at the, uh, the PJC Organic as a fertilizer company. They own the Renaissance brand of fertilizer, and Pam Newgum is out in the parking lot. Uh, they've just, I've just worked with them over the last year. They've developed the first granular product in the country that has a little bit of nitrogen, not a lot, because we didn't want a lot, but it's got molasses, it's got kelp in there, it has some biochar in there for carbon. So it has all of these things that are feeding the soil. And it's a unique product because the focus is totally removed from nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and really put on those things that help to build the system. So we have soil microbial life. That's what we don't see. It's collectively been known since the, since the mid-1990s as the soil food web. Things like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, these guys are the keys to nutrient availability. They're absolutely central to disease resistance. If you embark on an organic lawn, the first two things that go away are surface grazing insect populations and fungal disease. I've been managing sports turf since 2002 organically, and I have never used a fungicide. Don't need it, because the beneficial fungal organisms that we encourage to grow create a protective shield around that root and do not allow fungal pathogens to become a problem. You may have heard of something called mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi are those very specific fungal organisms that form an association with the grass and they grow right into the root and they send their reproductive strands or hyphae many meters out into the soil and bring nutrients back to that grass plant well beyond the reach of the grass root system. So when that grass root is going down into the soil and it's taking up nutrients 
right around the edge of that root now is what we call a depletion zone because it's taken all the nutrients out of that zone and there are no, none left there until you make another application. But if you do a one-time inoculation with mycorrhizal fungi and then these organisms grow right into the root and they send those hyphae out, there's no such thing as a depletion zone anymore. You've cut your need for fertilizer by 50% for very short money, dollar or two, a thousand square feet. So we're working on getting that incorporated into fertilizers. So now we're beginning to understand how these natural soil ecosystems work. Soil has long been a mystery, and we're just beginning to unravel that, and there's so much more to learn about how these natural ecosystems work. The one thing that we clearly know is that when we're in the highly managed landscape, which all of our residential properties for the most part are, we're trying to mimic the natural ecosystem. Instead of bypassing it or feeling that we have to go to war with nature or to fight it, we mimic what's happening naturally. And that's where really the successes come from. We have air in the grass system. So both grass roots and microbes have to have oxygen. Grass will not survive without oxygen. So aerobic soil is in the presence of oxygen, and anaerobic soil is in the absence of oxygen. A healthy, productive soil should be about 25% air spaces. So we operate on the principle called pore space, where all soil particles from the microscopic sheets of clay to the largest grains of sand are surrounded on all sides by air. Air contains oxygen, oxygen critical for the root of the grass plant to grow. Soils go anaerobic for two different reasons. Compaction, so you, any of you that have had children or grandchildren and, and followed them through sports over the years are very familiar with the center of a football field or a goal of a soccer field, where's the bare spot? You know, there's no grass there. It's because it's so compacted. What happens is the downward mechanical pressure on soils eliminates those air spaces, those air pockets, and causes particle to touch particle, and then we lose the oxygen and the soil goes anaerobic. That grass didn't disappear because the kids tore it all up. What happens in anaerobic conditions, alcohol begins to be produced. The good beneficial organisms decline, the bad guys take over, the anaerobes take over, begin to produce alcohol. One part per million alcohol can solubilize plant cell walls. In a compacted soccer goal, alcohol can be 25 parts per million. So it's literally dissolving the roots of the grass plant. So when a lawn gets compacted, grass gets compromised because the root system starts to degrade, and then we end up with a bare spot. So then we aerate. So aeration is introduction of air, or oxygen, back into soils. So presently that's done with, you, know, you rent an aerator or you have your lawn care provider aerate for you. Um, you know, it's always a beneficial process. At some point, if you build the biology, you don't have to aerate forever. We're actually working on a product now where we're hoping that within a couple of years at the retail market, be able to offer you a hose end sprayer where you put a biological preparation into a hose end sprayer, screw it onto your hose, and walk around and spray the hose and aerate your lawn at the same time. And that will all happen microbially. And it will be the microbial action that will work its way down. We have water. 20 to 25 percent of the soil should be moisture to support the plant. The technical term is called field capacity. So think of a heavy rain event or an irrigation system that has run, and you have all these air pockets in your soil. All these air pockets fill up with moisture, and then through some natural amount of time and based on percolation rates, all the freestanding water drains away. The moisture then that remains is field capacity, and that way it should be between 20 and 25% of the soil, and we should retain 25% air spaces, and then the rest of the soil is sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. So many people think that water equals kindness to plants. That is just natural. As a greenhouse grower for 37 years, I can tell you that water can be kindness to plants and it can also be the death of plants. 
I used to specialize in growing big sphagnum moss baskets way back 20 years ago before most people were doing it. And I remember selling one 15 years ago to a woman, and it was a lot of money. It was over $100 back then. And she told me her exposure, where she was going to put it, and I said, told her, this is, these are the ones you want for that. Take that water it twice a week. Eight days later, she brought it back to me completely dead. So I always had this thing I would do, and I'd go up and I'd say, I don't believe it. I took 110 days to grow that, and you killed it in eight. <laughs> and then that would immediately put them. But I said, I'm going to give you another one, because the customer's always right. But what did you do to this thing? She said, I told you to water it twice a week. She said, I watered it every day. She said, I thought if twice a week was good, every day would be better. So I said, if you water this next one every day, it's going to die too, but you're not going to get number three. So I advise you to cut back on the water. More off, grass doesn't need a lot of water. Grass is not a water plant. Water causes more problems to grass than it solves. If you ever have to make a mistake in irrigation of a lawn, always go to the dry side. When you see a lawn brown out in August, there's nothing wrong with that. That's nature. That is genetics. Our grasses do not have the genetics to photosynthesize their own foods in hot weather. It just can't happen. It can happen down south because they're different grasses, but it can't happen here in Wellesley. So we can keep it out of dormancy by watering it through August, but if you overwater it in August, you eventually are going to cause some serious problems with the plant that will manifest themselves in September in terms of cool weather fungal disease. So deep thorough waterings are preferable. Uh, so we want to deliver a half an inch of water at each irrigation. Uh, right now, with the rain that we've had, irrigation systems shouldn't even begin to be thinking about being put on until sometime in early June. Typically, in this part of New England, you're putting it on somewhere right about now, Mother's Day weekend. But this year, they shouldn't even be on for two or three more weeks. If anybody turns irrigation on now, on top of all this moisture, they'll end up in fungal disease, especially if you've done a recent fertilization lush grass in response to spring nitrogen with excess water equals fungal disease in June. Um, so uh, if you have an irrigation system twice a week, uh, irrigation companies that come in and put in irrigation systems don't know how to grow grass. They don't know how to grow grass. They can't grow a bean in a glass of water. They can put in irrigation systems. They put it in, they set the clock to come on three times a week for 15 minutes a zone and they walk away. It's the absolute worst way to water a lawn. In 15 minutes, you get nothing there. If you have what they call a rotor head that spins back and forth, it takes 70 seconds to make a cycle. In 15 minutes, it means it's only making 11 cycles. And you put a tuna fish can out at the end of that thing, and you can't even collect a measurable amount of water. So that zone wants to be, if you have a misting zone, that's a different story. Those little tight areas, that puts out a lot of water, but typical lawn heads don't. So twice a week for 35 or 40 minutes a zone. That gets a half an inch of water out there, and that half inch of water penetrates down four, five, six inches. That's the way you want to water. In the middle of the summer, we can kick it up to a third time uh, once we really get up into the 80s or, you know, if it gets warm. But the idea that you shouldn't just turn it on in the spring and leave it at one time, you're going to waste water, you're going to hurt the plant, you're going to damage the landscape. So water should be used judiciously. So what do we add? For the most part, we add what manufacturers want to sell us. We add what, ha what looks good in a bag with the claims that are made on the bag. That's the one reason that the four-step program has been so wildly su successful for corporate interest in the United States, because you don't have to know anything. All you have to know is how to read. And you buy bag one or two or three or four, and you flip it over, and you do exactly what the manufacturer wants you to do, right? And if a little works, a little bit more might be better. So we tend to go a little on the heavy side. That's really what they want. It's all about revenue. The pre-emergence crabgrass control products that people use in April so they won't get crabgrass. Crabgrass is not a problem in your lawn. Crabgrass is a symptom. The problem is that you have a bare spot the size of a silver dollar. You're cutting your grass too short. The soil pH is out of balance. Uh, the soil is very compacted. Crabgrass loves all these things. You're cutting your grass really short. All that stuff is the problem. Crabgrass is simply the symptom that manifests itself from an underlying problem. 
So the non-chemical strategy for getting rid of crabgrass, which is easy to do, it doesn't happen overnight like it does with chemicals. It takes about three growing seasons, a spring, fall, spring, or a fall, spring, fall. And it's bringing, it's, it's just solving those problems one at a time. So my pre-emergent herbicide is a bag of crabgrass. That's where I'm going to start. But those companies that sell us that pre-emergence product every April to put down have absolutely no interest in having you solve the crabgrass problem, right? What happens if you solve the crabgrass problem? Where does corporate revenue go? Right down the tubes. That whole product line is dependent upon you buying that material every 12 months, never solving a problem. So we have fertilizers, we have pre-emergent herbicides, post-emergent herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. All of these things are all in our arsenal to grow our lawns because we've been taught that that's what we should do. Is fertilizer plant food, rose food, lawn food, another lawn food, all-purpose plant food? There is absolutely no food for any plant in any one of those containers. Nothing. All that's in there is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are raw materials. They're mineral raw materials that act as catalysts in physiological processes of the plant. So if we're dealing with grass, and we put down a lawn fertilizer, the nitrogen in the lawn fertilizer does, it stimulates this growth and that growth and that growth, and it makes the grass get greener. The green is chlorophyll in the blade of grass. Chlorophyll in that blade of grass reacts with energy from the sun in the presence of carbon dioxide and moisture. There's microscopic openings on the underside of the grass blade called stomata. They open and close at dawn and dusk. Carbon dioxide goes right inside that blade of grass, reacts with the chlorophyll, and produces carbohydrates, sugars, and amino acid. That's plant food. The plant makes its own food, no food whatsoever in any of these containers. The plant grows with that food, it stores that food for future growth, and 80% of that food that it makes becomes an exudate that goes into the root system. Half of that drives the root system, and the other half is exuded in the soil and feeds microbes and the microbes, the desirable microbes, colonize the grass just to get those exudates. That's like cake and ice cream to those guys. <laughs> they, they, those carbohydrates, that's what it is. It's just sugars that feed that microbial community. So no food whatsoever in these bags that we buy. So our goal now is to not get into this trap that think we have to continue to buy food. We just are creating a situation with that grass and allowing that grass to more efficiently produce its own food. If we raise the height of cut from two to three inches, we can improve the ability of the plant to produce produce itself uh, 350 more times the food. Clover, good or bad, um, are we, how, how long am I going, am I going for an hour? I thought the questions were going to happen outside. Am I going to take questions in here too? Oh, all right. I, they told me outside to not take, all right, so I just got mixed. All right, so uh, mixed. Uh, I was going by the clock here. I thought I was going to three. Okay. So clover, good or bad? I'm not the guy that's going to say clover is bad. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer. On the right, there's an organic lawn with a little bit of clover. That's the entire patch of clover in 1,000 square feet. Misplaced plants. These guys are all wildflowers or medicinal foods, with the exception of crabgrass. And we can thank the federal government because they brought crabgrass here from China in the 1840s as a forage crop, and it didn't work. So now we have a non-native weed. Uh, so we have these weeds that we manage. An organic lawn will, for the most part, suppress all of those guys. We might have grubs in the lawn. Grubs are a larval stage of a various beetle species. We monitor, we look for them, we develop threshold levels. If you've got 10 or 12 or more, you're going to treat with an organic or beneficial nematode, or there's a product that will be out in the next year called Grub Gone, which is a new approved Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, we're going to treat around the 1st of August uh, if we have this situation. Surface grazing insects, chinch bugs, bill bugs, webworms, you probably don't have them. Uh, but the industry puts you in fear of them because they sell lawn insect control. Uh, what happens is lawn insect control might take out these guys if you have them, but they're going to take out all the good guys too. 
and 99% of the insects that are in your lawn are the good guys. We have the fungal pathogens, also known as fungal disease. That's the biggest panic that gets thrown into people for grass, and you buy fungicides. Fungicides are pretty nasty chemicals, which you probably don't want to play around with uh, at the homeowner level. But all we have to do is to get the fungal microbes in the soil, the beneficial ones in the right place, and the bad guys are suppressed. <laughs> I'll just finish up with showing you some pictures of how we can be successful. I've worked with uh, Boulder uh, for a number of years. Uh, this was a municipal neighborhood park that was failing. It was only six years old. Uh, this goes back to 2010 and 11 when the programs weren't anywhere near as sophisticated as we are today. Uh, all during the active growing season, no pesticides or synthetics, compacted, bare spots, challenged, uh, anaerobic, uh, just a not a healthy system. They were going to rip it up and build a new park. And they said, we won't waste your time. We converted the entire city of Boulder to all organic. We won't waste your time. And I said, no, let's, let's, let's play with this. So there's what it looked like. You can, that's how compacted it was. That's all we could get out of there for a plug. Minimal density, very unhealthy, a lot of weed pressures. And that's what it got turned into. And on close-up, you can see the weeds are gone without herbicides. They've been replaced by grass. When I first went there, it smelled. It was anaerobic. There was not a soul on the property. And when I went back three years later, there was a guy playing a guitar. There were kids having a picnic. The swings were being used and all of that. So in three years, for really short money, we changed that system and allowed to create a system for grass to thrive. Another project in Colorado heavy pesticide and synthetic fertilizer pressure, stopped cold turkey, and you can see there's no weeds. People say if you stop herbicides, weeds will come. 7.3 acres of sports turf, not a single weed in it, a year and a half after stopping. One of our fields in Marblehead, same thing, six, seven, eight, nine years organic, no weed pressures, baseball fields, field hockey fields, and then just here's an organic lawn put down by Kentucky Bluegrass Sod, one of my trial projects. We fertilize this at less than half of what the conventional industry would do. Conventional industry would put down five pounds of nitrogen. This got a pound and a half, 1.7 pounds is all it took because it's all about building the microbial life. And you can see, and there's our weed problem. You know, one little patch of clover that was pre-existing in that soil that certainly doesn't damage the aesthetic of the rest of the property. So that's sort of the whirlwind overview of what we have in the lawn. And so now what we try to do is to solve problems one at a time as opposed to embarking on programs that treat symptoms. So with that, why don't we throw it out to questions at this point? All right. Thank you, thank you, Chip. Uh, always very enlightening. And we'll just make the same request we made earlier. Um, as hard as it is, keep your questions to a general nature. Thank you. Yes. It should be six inches, but very often it gets skimped to three. So three is what I end up finding, you know, very often when I'm out there on a lot of projects. But industry specifications, it should be six inches minimum. Yes. Uh, so uh, I keep hearing that the new thing in golf course management is to remove trees because of fungus on the grass. And we, we have that problem here in Wellesley, our country club has taken down over 100 trees. Can you speak to that? Is there some way of solving that fungus problem that require tree what, what is the fungus problem that they have, the, the little mushrooms popping up? That's all good. That's all manifestation of the good guys. So the fungus that is, see, that's the disconnect in the industry. That's the total disconnect between conventional management and what's happening. Any fungal organism that is colonizing the roots of a tree does not have a detrimental impact on the growth of turf grass.
It's, 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 micro, it's ectomycorrhizal fungi that are colonizing the roots of the trees. And ectomycorrhizal fungi do not colonize grass roots. It's endomycorrhizal. So, I think it's fungus on the lawn, on the, the grass, that they feel like the shade is producing. Well, that's a different story. That, that's a different story if, it, if it's shade. So they want the white. I mean, all grass is a full sun crop. But then again, it, it's growing those grasses that are tolerant. Um, you know, typically greens and tea boxes aren't in shady spots, and trees should be put out. You know, in the fairways, um, as light levels go down then you can end up in fungus situation. In an organic program, what we would do is we would say be using humic acids. And I'm doing golf course transitions right now, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're building the beneficial fungi in there to outcompete the, the pathogens that could be causing a problem with the lower light levels. But it's a different, it's a disconnect because they don't typically think, I mean, golf is generally run on NPK. So they look at that and they look at, oh, we've got to get rid of trees, when in reality you could keep some of the trees, focus on a different fungal community in the soil, and probably outcompete much of the problem. Yep, way well, yep. Funguses that grow in places that used to be usually are beneficial. And what that is, is through the natural decomposition of the root system, fungal organisms are largely responsible. They're called the saprophytes. Saprophytic organisms are the decomposers. And you generally, in areas where their trees used to be, grass is usually, if there's grass there or plant material, is actually usually greener. It self-fertilizes because you have all that decomposition of the wood material that is actually fungal organisms breaking it down into usable nitrogen. And that's a, there's a fairy ring fungus that uh, some that you may at see, if you may have ever seen a circle of dark green in a lawn, or a, lot, or a squiggly line of dark green in a lawn. If it's new construction, it's usually because somebody, construction guy, buried a two by four out there. And the fungal organisms are breaking down that wood and turning it into nutrient. The other is, is with stumps or, or root that's in there. Uh, and that's called fairy ring fungus, but it's not a pathogen, it's actually a beneficial. First step would be soil test, and then second test, second step would be grass seed, because you really want to get those bare spots into something that's growing. I wouldn't panic about the weeds right off the bat. You know, that's something that can you know happen. You know, the most important thing is to get some grass growing in there. Um, if you have certain weeds in in these bare spots, you could use the Roundup alternatives products by like trade names of horticultural vinegar, uh, Burnout, Avenger is another one. Uh, they run the gamut from citric or citric acid based, acetic acid based, orange concentrated orange oil, D-limonene. Those are topical burn, so you can, before you put the grass down, you could spray the weeds with that material, knock them back, and then we just did that for a, a client the other day. We hit the weeds, and there's a little bit of grass there. If you use these materials and you have weeds in with the grass, you spray the grass and the weed, the grass blades will turn brown pretty quickly, but it will not kill the grass because grass is a monocot and it won't kill the crown. You'll get about a three-week cosmetic blemish, but you throw some compost right on the top of it, throw the seed right on there. The weed has been killed, the grass hasn't, and in three weeks it all comes back as a, as a green lawn. Well, urine spots. <laughs> Concentrated nitrogen. So in urine is high nitrogen. Uh, generally higher in female than male dogs, but it can happen from both. So it's that concentration 
it actually burns the grass. Same way if you bought a conventional water-soluble fertilizer and, and put it at a double rate, you're going to burn the grass. So you get the brown patch in the middle, and then you get a bright green ring growing out around the side of it. That's because that your urine, the urea, has dissipated out to here, and it's acting like a fertilizer out here. So for that uh, handful of compost, the beneficial organisms in compost will neutralize the salt in the urine, and then that will that grass seed, and it'll grow right through it. Or if you see it happen right off the bat, flush it with water, and that'll dilute it, and you won't get the burn. Yes. No, you just stop all of the chemicals, and what you do is when you begin to start your new program, you just become aware that you want to focus on the soil and the grass. So it's the, it's the strong focus in the conversion on soils, and that's when we, when we talk about this, is we talk of frame it in terms of a transition period. So there is, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, chemicals are quick fix instant gratification organic is not so you're going to have a year year and a half of transition it shouldn't get worse before it gets better but until you finally get to that point but in that in that transition it's focusing on things like you know introducing things like the humates or you know those types of things or looking for fertilizers that have humates in them things like the molasses uh, there are microbial preparations that you can buy that will stimulate microbial activity. In a transition, those are absolutely as important as the bag of fertilizer. Um, I've heard by uh, a friend of mine who uses an old-fashioned push mower and uh, has said that it's great to just leave the uh, grass things on the lawn. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know if that's something that one can do um, throughout the cutting season, or just in the beginning, or in the end. No, nope. leaving grass clipping. Again, every university that, that specializes in turf management will tell you that recycling grass clippings is the only appropriate way to handle them. Uh, when you return them to the soil, uh, those saprophytic organisms break them down into organic matter and it raises the organic matter and you're cycling nitrogen and potassium right back into that soil. You can pick up a pound of nitrogen which is equivalent to one and a quarter fertilizer applications a year just by recycling grass clippings. There are about three or four weeks coming up when if you're cutting on a seven week inter a seven day interval that the grass might grow faster in seven days than you get that sort of hayfield look on the lawn with the, that you don't want because that can cause problems. So there are three or four weeks in the spring in this region of the country where you might bag and remove, but all the other 22, 23 weeks of cutting should be recycling back. If you're going to seed a lawn, the, the absolute best time to start a new lawn from scratch with grass seed is the third week of August to the first week of October. That's because genetics line up perfectly for that to happen. If you've got an existing lawn and it's thin, you can successfully get grass. I mean, we seed athletic fields in the middle of June. Uh, but if you have a non-irrigated site, you probably want to get your seed all down by Memorial Day. If you have an irrigated site, you can seed right up to about the 4th of July. Then you take about a seven-week break because it's too hot, and then you pick it back up again at the end of the summer. Maybe one, one more question. Just take a roll. I, that's a great question. I mean, I have, I when I on all my projects, I make them carry a ruler in the back of the on, on the lawnmower to measure because when you set the dial on the lawnmower, whether it's a one or a two or three, it has no correlation to inches. So you just take a ruler and you stick it down until you can touch the soil, and you should be at three inches after the cut. Then over a seven day period, it grows up to about three and three quarter, and then you cut it back to three. So you operate on the principle of one third of the blade gets removed at each mowing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so thank you everyone for coming and many thanks to you, Chip, and to all of our speakers, to our planning committee, our co-sponsors. Um, the NRC will continue to be in touch with you. We're gonna be sending an online feedback form to everyone who attended. Please take a few minutes to just let us know what you got out of today and if you have suggestions for the future, um, it'll be a very brief survey. Um, and thank you so much again. Best wishes for a happy and environmentally friendly Mother's Day. <laughs>